Of course, not the greatest level of details, uh, but it will give you, and hopefully, a good overview of how to think about these two the completely different categories of value. So, in terms of the performance index, um, if you remember last Wednesday, I did a little derivation for Beam, where uh, we were finding uh, for the condition we had, uh, if we wanted a beam with minimal weight uh, and a certain strength, um, we were, well, I did a plate. So with a plate here, the exponent was one half of the strength and the full size of the density. Um, so we're here. Um, this one is done for an actual beam. The difference between a plate and a beam is, uh, on one of them, it's, it's just fully solid. Uh, and that was the easiest derivation, of course, so that's the one we did in class. So that means that if you have an, an application in bending, you're, you're more interested um, in the weight of the material than its strength. Uh, if, if what you're trying to do is you have enough space, of course, to put the extra material, and that's sometimes it's not the case. Um, so these material performance index, uh, they can help you, uh, just generally speaking, if you're trying to decide, okay, am I going to use a foam here, am I going to use a metal, am I going to use a foam? So it's at the very beginning, typically, of the design process. And there are charts put together for all the different conditions. So again, this is the one we, we had a beam here, which essentially is a plate. Um, that you can change the height, and that was only um, the square root of the yield strength um, over the, the density that is the performance criteria. But it will vary. So if you have the, essentially a shape that you can vary the thickness, that's where you get your, your different exponent here. Um, yeah, pretty good. So, it's, it's useful if you're at the very early stage, and, and, and what you see from this is if you're thinking about um, an application in motion, just a rope, a lot of times steel would be advantageous because the steel, even though it's heavier, it can become a lot stronger through processing. Um, if you have an application in bending or in compression, that's where you start looking into other materials that have a lower density because the density is more important than the strength in as far as the ratio. So if you remember these charts, um, again, it's at first if you just print it from the book and, and try to use the dotted line here, that gives you essentially material that are equivalent. And then if you try to get more strength, then of course you want to be on that side. So if we take this application intention and move it up, we're going to find ceramic composite as being the higher performance on a strength per weight basis. Uh, but if you have other criteria, like fracture toughness, which comes, of course, with its own set of material property index, um, we won't go through all of these in details, but they derive the same way. It's essentially saying what I want is um, a certain balance between my strength, in this case, and the fracture toughness. Um, what you find uh, on these examples, uh, yeah, this one is, is strength and fracture toughness. And there's a specific reason why I put that here. Unfortunately, we, I don't think we have the time to go through all the details. But sometimes what you want with a, a pressure vessel or a certain structure is that you will tolerate a crack through the thickness, then it starts leaking, but it's not failing, really. So it's, it's kind of a, what they call a fail-safe, or it's not catastrophic if, uh, like it will happen if you had a more brittle material. So you're not reaching the critical crack length until you start leaking, so you avoid essentially the complete break of the structure. Depressurized before, it, it, is, it fails in two pieces. Um, so that's the reason why this chart's there. Um, it's a little bit more complicated, of course, if, you, if you're if trying to have a design with a lot of fracture toughness. Um, 
some of the materials that we were very interested in, uh, just in base of the of the strength, these composites, they do fairly poorly here <laughs> in terms of uh, the, 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 the fracture toughness compared to the strength. Um, so essentially, they can be very strong, but they're not exactly as reliable if they have a crack in them, is the problem. Um, so in terms of fracture toughness designed for a certain stiffness, that's what we have here, um, we can look um, essentially at metallic alloys at first. Um, and the reason is they have a lot of ability to deform, to blunt a crack. And we'll, we'll go through some of that at the end today. Um, before we do that, this is a slide I had, um, was wanting to cover last time, but it actually fits very well in here. Uh, underground storage tanks are used essentially in any uh, gas station. Um, you put them in there, you have to backfill them properly, and there's, um, these days there's always a certain form of monitoring system. So if there is a small leak, then there's a sensor signal and people are supposed to do something about it. Um, the reason I'm bringing this up to you when we, I was saying I was going to talk about metals, I was going to talk about plastic, is this is one industry where there's, maybe not right now, but as of about five years ago, there was an, about the same amount of tanks that were sold out of steel, made out of steel, than composite. And um, the, of course, the main aspect here for people, uh, the owners of these uh, gas stations, is cost. If they can meet the regulation, they're thinking, you know, which one's going to cost more at the beginning, which one's going to cost me more maintenance. Um, so as it turns out, they about break even. Um, and why do they break even? Um, the composite tank, um, as you'll see, I'll explain on the next slide, is, is made in a fairly efficient way. This is probably the cheapest way to make a composite, you'll see. Um, and, you know, it it's, doesn't require cathodic protection, per se, so when it comes to the site, you don't have to put anodes in the ground and dig holes at other location and monitor that cathodic protection system. So it's, you, you put it in, and yes, nowadays, it's actually two wall thicknesses, so if the first one fails, you can get a signal, so there is a sensor system to tell you, oh, the primary container has failed, and now I've got to worry about it. Um, there were only two or three big manufacturers of these, and it's a very specialized uh, industry. So you make essentially um, a big template of what you want the pipe to look like. So it's got all these ribs to reinforce it, so it's good against compression with the, uh, the ground. Um, so you, you essentially spray from the inside um, the <coughs> resin, and it also has chopped fibers. So these could be about this long, and they spray it at the same time in sequence with the resin. So you're essentially building up that wall just like spray painting. Um, and in the process here, you can see if the mold had the pattern, what they did is they put a little layer of reinforcement that stopped the, uh, the resin being sprayed from continuing on. So if I'm shooting here, at some point they put a little layer to make this empty space. So it's all built from the inside out and then you separate the, the mold in half if you have a tank. Um, very efficient. Um, one of the biggest issues with these tanks is what happens with the, the, the structural integrity over time. Because they're filled with a fluid and then there's ground pressure on the outside. It's not even, you know, you'll have big trucks coming over, you have all sorts of things over on the parking lot, and they will sag. So if you look at the vertical diameter and the horizontal diameter over time, it's going to become more of an elves. Um, it's a little 
unfortunate to have to design for it, but why not the criteria? So I put it in the ground, it's perfectly round, and over time it will be a little bit like this. So one of the criteria, if there is any distress, or if you do a detailed inspection of the tank, is it, when you clean it up and you have to get in there, they will measure these dimensions to know where, how far did they go in terms of um, tree deformation that happens over time. <clears throat> so we're going back here. What you'll see is um, you have the cylinder, but then you have a cut at the end. And the biggest problem in terms of the design of this is how you interface between the two components when you deform. Um, if the cup will want to, if it's, if it's a perfect plane at, at first, when you compress it, it becomes out of a out of plane. Uh, just if you take like a tennis ball, you fit in half and then you squeeze it so you have the sides trying to pull. Um, and that's the biggest issue in terms of uh, designing this that you, you expect you'll have some stresses in tension between that cup at the end and the cylinder. Um, when you inspect it, so at least you know where to look for cracks. Um, so that's that's a good thing. And to some extent, you can reinforce it. It's, it's, so it's typically not exactly the same over here. Um, and we see it actually. Then um, on the entire length. Um, you can make them in different sizes, you just need another mold essentially uh, for each one of them. So they put on and the critical aspect for this design is actually doing the installation. You have to put the aggregate correctly here to <coughs> support the tank. And whether this is reasonable or not to expect, um, they are essentially allowed to account for a certain level of quality of this backfill here. So if a contractor was to come and just put dirt here, it will potentially fail the tank. So there is some installation expertise and you need some inspections. So it's, 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 it's not perfect, right? Because you put it on, you think it's all right, and then all of a sudden later you realize, oh, the guy didn't put they didn't put the support where it was supposed to put it, the ground settle, and all these things. These are all issues you don't have with the steel. The steel, if it ever wants to carry more load, it will deform. And it's not going to start cracking under these conditions one day. Um, the problem with steel here is really the, the long-term corrosion resistance. So if you, if you have a condition where there's groundwater, at a certain depth, so let's say now we have the steel. The way you do the steel is you do put a coating on it, and you don't really mind as much how you bury it. It's very strong. Okay? If it's if it starts deforming, that's sort of okay. But then you have the sacrificial handle. So I'm going to put it here. Say this is this is the groundwater. I have my sacrificial handle, which I hope is in the same layer as where it, of, the, of the ground as where the um, the corrosion is taking place. So say you put a magnesium or, or a zinc atom here. Uh, if we have a simple system that is just sacrificial. The other way is to put a permanent anode, but then you need a rectifier to apply a certain voltage. So what happens really here is instead of removing steel through the corrosion process, you remove this metal. And we can go a little bit more details there, but it's, um, this is not a situation you can resolve with, you know, a material performance index or anything like that. You have to look at every parameter, and unfortunately, you're faced with completely different issues in one case than the other. And that's why industry-wide people don't necessarily agree on how to do it. Um, so I guess it's uh, one reason for. Of course, we want to we want to think we can make this sophisticated, it can be very precise. But the truth is, a lot of times there's going to be extra variable. In terms of optimization, there is a class, and I listed the number on the first slide. Um, so I took that class a long time ago. It was 3.57 material selection, design, and economics. 
the year I took it, I can tell you it was a lot about optimization, which, you know, as you can see, I'm covering very, very briefly today. Um, my objective is more to give you some idea. This is actually a very good reference. It's Ashby. It's got a bunch of edition um, about just the concept of selecting materials, looking at constraint, um, and um, trying to optimize a certain variable. So you have to find what exactly I'm trying to do. Again, a lot of times it's overall cost. We try and cut that down as much as we can, but we have to include manufacturing. In this case, we have to include installation and service uh, uh, maintenance. Um, so it can be uh, from the concept to the application, you're becoming more dependent on your knowledge of what actually you, you need, you're going to need to do um, at each step of the way. So now we're going a little bit deeper into the uh, metallic albums. Um, and I brought some examples that I want to circulate. Um, most metals, unless you're talking about single crystal turbine blades, have a lot of grains in them. Um, this is an example where you, you have more than grains. So just for, for clarity, here, this is one grain. And all these little lines that you see here are just twin boundaries. So it's just part of the same grain, but uh, it looks different here. But it allows on a kind of a simple alloy, this is just copper, to see actually where the grain boundary is. So you have one here, you have one there, you have one there, you have another one here. This is a big one in this plane. So depending on where you cut, these grains are three-dimensional. You'll see them look smaller or bigger, but the bigger one you see is probably because you're cutting right through the middle of it. Um, the reason why they are important is uh, when you're thinking about cracking and deformation, which is our next topic. Um, just trying to convince you here, I got some samples that were um, heat treated in different conditions for different grain sizes. And you'll see this one here, it's got a lot of texture. So what happened is when you deform it, the grains are so big that it becomes a rough surface. Um, in the original condition, from looking at the, the lower temperature here, this is the same, this, these three are the same material, just treated at different temperatures. So at the lower temperature, it's very, very smooth. And the higher roughness is actually at an intermediate temperature because you had analogous grain growth in this condition. Some grains just start to grow and they grow and overcome smaller ones. And so you have bigger grains here than at the higher temperature. Yeah, um, yeah, I think the best example is the copper side. The other one was for another purpose. You can circulate it, please. Um, why am I talking about grains? Well, you know, you probably learn of nanometals and nanometallic alloys. So the grains themselves have a lot of implications with respect to the mechanical properties. Um, if you have a very small grain, all the actions of deformation, like by that in metals, when I mean deformation, I mean movement of dislocations. Uh, to move these dislocations, you combine with it that space. So the tighter the space, the harder it is to deform. And there's an all patch relationship for that. It's a fairly sim simple process. But essentially, we're saying that the way you create the permanent change in the geometry of the piece of metal is by moving this location in the grains, in the individual grains. Um, of course, depending on the crystal structure you have, it's going to be a different deformation behavior. Um, copper and aluminum have very high symmetry crystals, so they will be deforming a lot more, they'll be a lot more ductile than if you take um, a quench steel it has completely um, irregular microstructure. So over here what, what I'm showing is just this concept of a dislocation as a loop. Uh, that's about all I can hope for you guys to remember here. Um, in addition perhaps to the idea that when I start deforming I have a certain quantity of these 
call them defects, but they're always there. So uh, these characteristics of the microstructure, this dislocation, instead of uh, sort of going away it, through the deformation, they actually multiply. And the reason they multiply is you have these loops of dislocation, and normally they're not in the same plane. They go around in different planes in the, in the um, microstructure in the grain. And there will be a certain plane where it's a lot easier to move the dislocation. So it, you can see here, as you see small, I have a loop that starts out of plane, and all I can see here in this specific plane is one segment of it. So the segment actually starts to move and expand, and when it's completely done, I can recombine and now I have a, an extra dislocation. So, and we call that dislocation multiplication. It happens. Uh, anytime you take a piece of metal at below the, well, if you had very, very high temperature, you can also eliminate some of these dislocations, but for steel and aluminum at ambient temperature, it really multiply. Uh, the way it will look like if you keep deforming back and forth the material is a little bit like this. Uh, you can call these uh, vein structures where you have regions in the metal where you have very, very high density of dislocations. Uh, so those are the dark area here, and then you have other regions that are relatively free of dislocation. So you start within the grains. So this is, by the way, just a single crystal. Within a single crystal, you start forming these substructures for the dislocation. Um, it's at a very, very fine scale. Uh, a lot of times, we don't take too much of these, but it, they, I think, really help understand how you can keep deforming and keep deforming the material. There's no limit here on how many times you're going to do it. If you become too tight, what happens is now you start having Two, two dislocations that are kind of opposite sign to uh, balance each other and disappear all of a sudden. So there will be a certain point if we're talking about metals at ambient temperature, say a couple hundred percent strain deformations. If I started this long and I'm twice the length, I'm, I'm really hard at that point. I, I've created a lot of dislocation, but I reach a, a certain point where if I continue to deform, um, I'm, I'm just, I will be having as much creation as disappearance of these dislocations. So that point, though, again, is typically hundreds of percent. So if you should be all familiar with a typical stress strain curve for a piece of um, aluminum or steel where you, when you pull on it, you get a certain amount of deformation, say 20, 30 percent, and then the load starts going down and you fail. Well, that 20 or 30 percent is not the maximum that you can deform that material. What happens there is just that you have an, that instability where instead of having the strain being happening through the entire section of the specimen, it becomes localized in one area, you form a neck, and that's why you fail. So if you take the same material um, and you load it in compression, you just keep deforming it and it keeps getting stronger. Uh, there's a lot of implication for that if anybody in the class if it eventually does fine element analysis of any kind of structure where you can uh, include this behavior of the metal you're dealing with uh, when it starts deforming plastically. So you do a nonlinear analysis, you include all this behavior, but you don't want to include the, this curve as is because this is not a representation of the actual material. When you start deforming locally, it's, it's, it's continuing to get stronger, but you have a shorter cross-section at that point. So this is something I always emphasize when I talk about uh, plasticity. So why do we care so much about the plasticity? Um, I think the main reason is it governs a lot of why we use metals. Um, not that metals will look like they're really deforming. So if you remember last time what we did is we talked about stress concentration. We were talking about aerospace material and I said, okay, so I have this little area here. So this is my material. 
and say for, for our argument here that we're loading this way. So I'm loading this way and I'm moving from say a flange to the pipe and I got a stress radius between them. So what happens is I'm gonna have a lot more loading in this area, very, very close to the change in geometry. That's called stress concentration. If in this zone, it's really sharp, I can get a little bit of plasticity, a little bit of deformation. And that's taking place even before uh, I can really see a change in property. So it happens if you take um, a design that you know, wasn't really necessarily um, evaluated and criticized in details. Um, somebody's gonna say, well, I, I want this nice uh, sharp transition so I can, you know, put this on a, another structure <coughs> and not have any interference between the fillet here and the other components. So they won't, sometimes they won't even specify what the radius of this is. So it, the machinist is just gonna say, well, you know, I'd like to do it this way. <laughs> and that's where you end up. So between something this sharp and something smoother, it sometimes will make the difference whether you exceed locally in this stress concentration the yield strength of the material or not. Um, let's say for now that you did. So the machine is pretty tight and by applying even something like, let's say we'll say 20% here, this will give you an example of the yield strength. If you apply 20% of the yield strength and you sharpen up here, you can be at plasticity at that sharp point if you have a little torsion or depending on what the condition is. So the nominal load and the local load just become very, very different. What happens? Um, if this is going on only at once, typically on metals, nothing. You're, you're fine. You don't see any really change in the structure and you can continue. If you have, say, vibration, if this is a connection part of uh, a pipe assembly on a compressor or any, anything that has some industrial vibration, then you can start a crack here uh, because you plastically deform and now you're plastically deforming back and forth. So that becomes the problem here with the stress riser. Is if you if you had it smooth and you always remain elastic, you can open and close, um, apply the tension compression anytime you want. But by going beyond the the elasticity elasticity limit, again, what's going on is you have these dislocations moving back and forth, and they they don't consider that completely reversible, so it's not like just loading a spring and, and taking it apart. Now you have all these microstructural changes taking place, that's how you can see the cracks. Okay, so we initiated the crack. Now let's say for this argument here, the crack is a certain length, and that's really what I'm showing here on the plot. So I have a crack that started from a notch of a certain structure, so we don't really want it worry about what the structure is here. But what happens, um, <coughs> you remember last time we talked about K, and there's a, you know, some good reason for, we're gonna talk about material property. It's good to remember that this is essentially a function of the stress and the crack length. And then you, you, you have a lot of other parameters depending on your geometry. But it essentially helps you factor in the entire demand. So we're saying here that instead of just seeing a stress, you're seeing a nominal stress. This is nominal, remote stress for a certain characteristic of the crack, which is its length. So that's why we call it stress intensity. It's combining both nominal stress and crack length. Um, now, this concept here, um, becomes very interesting when you look at them. You can use these equations also, uh, the K equation, to tell you the stress distribution. Um, the interesting aspect is if you do a stress distribution profile, there's, actually, there's an analytical equation for it. Um, what you'll find is very, very close now. I have stress as a function of the distance from the tip of the crack. 
it's the stress essentially goes to infinity, very, very close to the crack, and then it's going to dampen out, so when you're far away, it doesn't matter anymore. If I have this situation where stress goes to infinity, well, it's not going to happen with metals because they deformed at a certain point. So this actually becomes truncated here when you read something of the order of the yield train. Um, depending on exactly what your condition is, we, we're showing here the difference between plane strain and plane stress. Uh, what really it is is, uh, in this case, you allow the material to shrink in the thickness direction, and in this one here, it's constrained. So this is the case of a, a relatively thick piece of metal as opposed to a fairly thin one. The thin one is going to reduce in, in, in thickness, and it will normally take a lot more load to break it. Um, I'm going fast or I'm slow. Tell me. Okay. <laughs> Um, for most metals, and we'll have an example which is actually different than that, but for most metal, this is taking place. Your, your behavior of the material allows you to avoid getting super high stressors at the tip of the crack because the deformation automatically gets activated. Um, I think that you intuitively, the same way we said that here, what happens if I if my stress exceeds the uh, the yield strain is I'm going to start deforming back and forth, and that's why I'm going to get a crack. I think that in the same way, if you think of something that's already a, as a crack and, it, and it's plastically deforming at the tip, when you open and close that crack. Uh, each time you have the stress going down and going back up, you're going to have some cyclic plastic deformation at the tip of the crack. And that, or, that is what causes that crack to advance. And last time we were talking about this a little bit in the aerospace example where it said um, you have a crack of a certain length and it's going to continue to grow if you keep applying that cyclic growth. If you don't, if you just keep the crack open and there's no issue with the environment in the middle, the crack will just stay there. It's not going to grow over time unless you vary that load and get this plastic deformation. So the plastic deformation, again, is happens. That's what you want to happen. The reason we use steel or aluminum or titanium is we know if it has to give a little bit, if it has to use this ability to stretch permanently, it will. Um, and what I'm showing here is an example of a fracture surface of, um, it's got to be steel, yeah, um, where it doesn't look really flat, right? You get these little circles going on here, and what these circles are, are we call them dimples. And they essentially, after the fact, it's, it's a half sphere of material. And what the white is, is just the ligament between the half spheres. So what happened? What happened is you deform at the tip of the crack over here by perhaps, let's put a number, let's say 70%, 100%. Something of that order. It's not the 20% that you get in the lab if you're doing a tensile test. It's a lot more. What happens at a certain point is the same way that you would start um, creating a void if you have a little particle in the material. There's always something that is some microscopic. Uh, it could be the grain boundaries, it could be an inclusion, it could be a lot of things that essentially allow for a debounded inter interface here to create, and now we're starting to have microvoids. Um, these microvoids um, will just start to grow and they'll join with each other depending on how much hardening you have. If you harden a, a lot the material, because now you start deforming more on these holes than, you, than in the bulk of the material. So if they become stronger, then you're increasing the resistance of the material to grow these words. So there's a certain number of characteristics that helps you resist 
the actual fracture. This is a big difference between starting to having a crack, starting to deform. That would actually happen a lot of times in actual um, equipment. What you don't want is the actual fracture. So, and one way to avoid it is to make sure that the material is going to behave this way where if I keep deforming it at the tip of the crack, it, instead of making big voids right away, it will deform, deform, eventually give you some micro voids. And the, 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 the longer you can delay these processes, the, the, the better is your ductility. Now, there will be conditions where this schematic here, by the way, this is very fine scale. Uh, so a typical grain in a microstructure would be about this size. And we're essentially looking at a, a good number of holes that created within the grain. Um, what you want to avoid with the same material, let's see here, um, on the top left, we're looking at um, steel. Steel will show this behavior sometime when it's very cold. Uh, what's going to happen is instead of having this plastic deformation, the movement of the dislocation, it takes time for that deformation <coughs> to take place. So if you have an impact, uh, old bridges, very old ships, you can go through history cases, oh, this one failed, this one failed. That's the reason. The reason is, instead of having uh, the movement of the dislocation of the blunting of any crack you had, it starts to separate. And one way it can separate in this, in the, in this top right is um, between the grains. Now, this happens sometimes when you have an environmental effect, so you have a high strength material and um, there is a little bit of contamination. It can happen. Um, in aerospace, if you have stress corrosion cracking, it's a behavior that um, is not the most common, but it's more problematic because in this case, instead of getting 100% deformation by forming all these dimples, it just separates on the boundary. So it leads to a much more brittle behavior uh, where you can't anticipate it uh, the way you anticipate if you keep deforming something. Um, now, some of these processes over here, we're looking at uh, some stress corrosion cracks. The, the problem with them is um, they're a lot harder to predict uh, in terms of their progression. So if you, you can have essentially a, a metal that doesn't have any crack, but if it's uh, steel at very low temperature and it starts failing this way where instead of stretching, and forming a crack, it just really starts to crack and, and break in a brittle matter, then you don't, you don't get any warning that you have a problem. You, you go from no crack to a complete fracture. So you try to avoid that, and um, most of the times it means understanding and controlling, making sure that you do have the uh, plastic deformation. So, I think what you can see, again, is it, it is important to have some understanding of what happens with the metal when you uh, want to use it. So for mechanical performance, the main reason, I think, uh, we would use metals for structural applications, we know that it's, it is forgiven. Uh, if I have a small crack, if I have a radius like this, it will blunt it and not necessarily lead to any problem down the road. But I did mention that there will be condition of environment, uh, temperature, if we have chlorides uh, for aerospace structure, for, for aircrafts, that um, even though here you don't get a failure right away, you can have a delayed failure over time. Um, <clears throat> so you can't win all the time, and this aspect that I mentioned even in the first lecture about the history um, becomes very important. Now, in terms of the metals, we're going to be closing up here about just the generality of material selection. Um, and I want to bring this example. This is um, a cryoprobe. 
and um, so consulting project I had where they built this and this is not the actual tube. It's got an inner carrier for open heart surgery. What we do is um, the surgeon is going to bend this outer layer for a certain pattern of ablation he wants to generate on the heart. And uh, by the time you have the right pattern and you put it on, what you do is uh, you insert a liquid that's going to turn into a gas when it's exiting these little portholes, if you'll see. Uh, so that's kind of an adiabatic expansion type thing. That's how you cool, essentially, at the very, at the very tip. And they have three different inner carriers, so the carrier splits into three, three different components. So you get cooling over, that's distributed over a certain length. And then you need some space, quite a bit of space on the outside of the inner carrier, inside of this outer shell to bring back the gas. So you're, you're actually pumping to make sure that you get as much circulation as possible. This needs to happen fairly quickly. Um, so, so additionally, they were using aluminum, and what we, uh, we worked to help them with was to see what would be the other options. Uh, they were interested mostly in the design of the outer carrier. This is a big diameter, and this tube is actually much thinner than what they were using, so you can think of a thin tube like this. You keep bending it back and forth because the surgeon wants to do a procedure, and then they decide to do another one and they're still using the same device. So it's a, it is a situation where you deform it back and forth, essentially. And you want to make sure that it's reliable. So a few things when we think about material selection that I think comes to everybody's mind right now is it's going to be cold. So steel, structural steel, you have, you know, it's, it's not a question of corrosion resistance. If you use stainless steel, you have to be a certain type of stainless steel that would not become brittle at, at low temperature. Um, one, so you, one of the key characteristics here that is the main limiting constraint is the ability to deform it back and forth without forming a kink. I, I, I can just do this a couple times here, just like if I take a straw, it, it will, it's going to kink right away. So you have to uh, work that characteristic in. And one of the design actually had a spring on the inside of the outer carrier to try to keep it round. Uh, but that spring takes a lot of space. <laughs> and what, the, what is the limiting criteria here is this can only be so big so the surgeon can deform it without any problem. At the same time, you need enough space between the inner carrier and the outer carrier to bring the gas back. It's going to operate at low temperature, and it's going to have to deform back and forth. So let me circulate it, and then we'll go through some of what comes to mind for selecting it. <coughs> um, space limitation. Uh, it turns out that most metals, um, would be strong enough to, for the thickness that we have. So we have the inner carrier. I mentioned about a spring. So let's say we'll, we'll put the outer layer first. So this is what we're designing for, an outer shell. The actual design was about three times the thickness of what you, you can see there. Uh, so you have the extra space. You can use it to put that spring, and the spring will be connected with the outside. Or if you say, I can find this material that's going to be really, really soft, and I can deform it back and forth. So this is an area that was the highest problem in terms of the selecting materials. Um, if we have strain here, stress, I'm just drawing some stress strain here for, for our discussion. If I take an aluminum, say I take annealed aluminum, and it has a very low strain, let's say here, for example, we say 5 psi. Um, it will typically, 
increase its strength a lot when I'm deforming it. Um, the reason is it had very little dislocation in the beginning. I heat it up, I cooked it, very nice microstructure. If I take another aluminum alloy, this one was cold work, so it essentially looks elastic for, say, twice the height. Then it's not going to harden as much when I deform it, plastically, when I reach the elasticity. And the reason is over here, I had very little dislocation and I keep adding them, it keeps getting stronger and stronger. This one is essentially already here. So this is really the way it works. If I, if I just pre-deform it and I'm just postponing this, this, I eliminate this behavior and I'm starting here. So what are the advantages and disadvantages? If I put a bend in the material uh, of a soft material, say up to this point, and that would be, say it's um, a vent we found out from analysis will give us, say, about 30% strength each time. It could be up more, up to 30 to 60, depending on how sharp that bend is when, when the surgeon is using it. So let's say we do that. Now, I have a very sharp bend and I want to take it off, right? I'm going to do another procedure. The first thing to do is to bend it back. Well, it's very hard to bend it back because the very middle of that bend is what's hard to bring back as a straight line because it, it now it's about twice the strength that it was at the beginning. So this is called the strain hardening, how much the strain increases. So the main criteria was a low end. We found that to be even more important to what exactly the, the yield strength was because the yield strength, we could vary it through the thickness. But if we, if we had a big strain hardening value, it was just not possible to bring it back. Um, if you think of what would be, if this was just a room temperature application, we'll think of uh, a lead. We look into these alloys just for fun because lead, when you deform it, you can essentially creep and it will heal itself. So you can maintain a certain density of dislocation at ambient temperature. And you can deform it back and forth. It doesn't really become any stronger. So we, we thought about this concept here. The main issue was, okay, well, I'm going to cool it up. And a lot of, and of course, lead is not put in the body. And there was some tin alloys that we looked into and it, it will even work a little bit at, at low temperature, but their problem was the, 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 the crystal structure of those tin alloys were a little unpredictable, so you could have a brittle behavior at low temperature. So to make this uh, kind of a short story for you, <laughs> uh, the aluminum alloy was very, very hard to beat um, because he, it's a, it's a relatively soft, it will have a very consistent behavior to the different temperature ranges. And the biggest issue was to go out and buy a certain aluminum alloy, a low strain alloy, that is always going to have the same properties. Because guess what, nobody <laughs> really sells you an aluminum thinking, oh, this has to be really soft and it has a certain consistency soft with little hardening. So there were different options there in terms of the alloying element to maintain the grain size because a pure aluminum alloy will trend to grow the grains very very quickly when you heat it up so you try to make it soft you anneal it and then all of a sudden the grains become disorganized you have some small grains some big grains so it, it was an issue in terms of the limitation of the material but it was also an issue of going against an industry that typically would, act, would care for properties that are, you know, I'll give you a minimum, it's going to be more than that, but in this case, we just really needed a very tight range. So the bottom line is they had to work with the vendor for the vendor to always be very, very consistent in very, very small quantity of impurity in the aluminum alloy that will make a big difference here in terms of the properties. So, and I guess another example where the material performance index was not really going to cut it. You have to look into it in more detail. Thank you. That's all I have for today. If you want to talk about any of this, I, I have a whole, I could probably talk a whole semester about mechanical properties.